Before you watch this, please keep in mind that this is how I shoot roller derby. This is not how everyone shoots roller derby, and I'm not saying that how other people shoot roller derby is right or wrong. This is just how I shoot roller derby. Also, please keep in mind that this video is not going to tell you how to become a photographer or how to set your camera up. There is a general understanding here that you understand how to control your camera. My name is Michael Wise. I'm with Tough Girls on Eight Wheels, and today I'm going to show you how I shoot roller derby photos. First step is preparation. Preparation for shooting roller derby is almost as important as actually shooting the game. There's nothing worse than showing up to an event with dead batteries in your camera or finding out that you've left your memory cards at home. Look, I've made these mistakes before and that's why I'm trying to help you here. The first thing I always do the night before an event is charge my batteries and erase my memory cards. Do not ever format your memory cards at a game because the odds are eventually you're going to end up formatting the photos that you took of that game and lose them. Now that you've got your batteries all charged up and your memory cards cleared, put the batteries in your camera, put the memory cards in your camera, format them, and turn your camera settings down to a base starting point. For me, I set my camera at ISO 100 at 200th of a second. That way, when I show up to the event, worst case scenario, I pull that camera up to my face and I sh fire off a shot, I'm going to get nothing but a black frame. Now that your cameras are all ready, it's time to load your bag up. Loading your camera bag up the same way will help you identify if you're missing something from your bag, like a lens, or your camera body, or your memory cards. That would be just the worst case scenario for me is to show up to an event that I just got done driving an hour and a half to and find out that I'm missing the camera body that I'm intending to shoot with that day. Now I want to talk about some of the extras that I put in my bag that will help make shooting the event a lot easier for me. Shooting an event where you're going to be up and down all day long, you're going to find that your knees are going to take quite a beating. So one of the main things that I always include in my camera bag is a pair of knee pads or things like water or having it like a granola bar in your bag. Look, shooting roller derby is an all day event and being hungry or thirsty or actually having really sore knees can really ruin your day. Being prepared is really important. So let's talk about gear. I'm not going to go into specifics about which brand or which specific lens to get, but I'm going to talk about some of the standard things that I would think about before I would purchase any equipment. Look, you can't buy every single lens in the world and buy every camera body on the planet. When I shoot roller derby, I'm trying to take as little gear as possible to the event, but still have the proper gear to shoot the story that I am looking to capture. When I'm filling my bag up, I'm looking to carry maybe three lenses tops. Any camera will just about work for roller derby photography, as long as it is probably a modern day camera that can shoot at a fairly decent ISO level. You're going to need specific gear in order to capture the game. One of my main go-to lenses is the 70 to 200 f2.8 lens. This allows me to shoot in venues that have very low light as well as capture shots that are wide and tight all within one lens. Another one of my favorite lenses is the 24 to 105 f4 lens. This allows me to take very very wide shots of a venue and it still allows you to get some nice tight shots up close. For those of you who like to shoot from the center of the track a nice real wide angle lens like a 16 to 35 is an outstanding lens to use from inside the track along with that 24 to 105 that I was talking about earlier. One of my personal favorite lenses is the 300 millimeter lens. Uh, a couple years ago I started shooting with an f4 lens and I found that I really liked the way that it compressed the background and made the player really pop in the image. This year I just currently upgraded to the f 2.8 version of this lens and give me a second here and I'll show you the difference between the, the sizes of these two lenses. Talk about size difference, you can't even hand hold this thing. Um, probably not useful for most typical photographers and to be honest with you this is going to be way out of reach price wise for most photographers and it's not going to make it to where you're unable to shoot the game. 
Let's talk about lights. Now, many of you roller derby photographers are going to be shooting with ambient light. Now, I choose to shoot with lights because a lot of the venues that I shoot at are very dark and I really want my players to pop. So, I use a light like the, like the Godox AD200 light. This is a great little flash um, that's very, very powerful. I can fire this flash approximately 2,000 times at about a quarter of power. So this will last me a whole day of shooting, no problem at all. Now that you've got your flash, you need to get it onto a light stand to get it above the players that you're gonna be photographing. Now, I have two different light stands here. This is a six foot light stand, and this is a 10 foot light stand. If I was to use a short light stand like this, every time this flash would go off, it would be just a direct beam of light into the player's face and that would affect the game. So we do not want to use something like a six foot light stand. We want to use something that's going to be above them and shooting down onto the player, like a 10 foot light stand. When you're picking your light stand, something that you want to keep in mind is a wide base. If you'll notice, this light stand has a very small base. This can be knocked over very easily. And uh, to be honest, it's not that stable. This 10 foot light stand has a very wide footprint. And thus, if somebody was to bump into this, it's gonna be a lot less likely to fall over. That still does not excuse you from not using sandbags on your lights. The last thing we want is somebody to knock down a stand. So we make sure to position the stand far enough away from the track that there's no possibility of anybody getting knocked into that light stand and falling onto the track, thus affecting the game, or in worst case, injuring a player. The last thing we want is the team or the sport to ban using lights altogether because it fell over and hit a spectator or fell over and hit a player and injured them. So keep in mind, safety first, use sandbags to anchor your light stands down to the floor. That way we don't have to worry about lights being banned at roller derby events. Now, I tend to use big reflectors like this because this helps guide the light to where I want on the track. That way the light is just not spilling everywhere. If I was to take this cone off of my flash and I pop it, the light is just going to go everywhere in the building. To make my player really stand out properly, I want to keep everything on the outside of the track fairly dark. And, and by using this cone, it'll make the light act kind of like a spotlight onto the track. Let's talk about one of my secret weapons to taking better roller derby photographers that most photographers do not use at all. Um, I'm talking about a light meter. Now, you don't have to get a $500 light meter. This is a Polaris flash meter. You can find these on eBay for like $85. Why is this important? When I light a track, I wanna light it evenly and I'm not using the back of my camera just to see if I've exposed that portion of the track properly. What I want to know is, are all my lights exposed the same throughout the track? This light meter will help me dial it in. My second secret weapon is a gray card. This is a color checker passport, but you can use any gray card. You take a picture of this, then you dial your camera to custom white balance, and you go to this frame position your camera frame over the gray white balance and set your custom white balance and then set your camera to custom white balance using that setting. That way when you're taking pictures at a roller derby venue where the floor is yellow and the walls are purple, your pictures are going to look uniform throughout your set of photos. And this will save you time when you go to edit photos later on after the game. Setting up. One of the best tips I can give you is showing up to the venue early as possible. Make sure you contact the team that you're going to be shooting for and let them know that you would like to show up at the same time that they're showing up to set up the track. Why is this important? Even though you've been shooting the same team for years on end, it only takes one time for you to show up and they flip the track the opposite way and you point all your lights in the opposite direction and you have to start all over from scratch. So I try to be there as early as possible and I communicate with the people setting up the track to make sure that nothing has changed. Another one of the benefits to showing up early is you get to put your lights where you want to put them. 
meaning you're not trying to wrestle over four other photographers that are also setting up lights. And trust me, here in Southern California, there can be a lot of photographers at a game. Light placement is key when you're taking pictures using flash photography. So I look at the track, being that I cannot photograph the entire track at any given point in time, I choose to light the portions of the track that are the most used. So what part of the track is most used? Well, let's look at the track. We have turn one, two, three, and four, and here's the start. Most of the game is played probably within this half of the track right here, between turns one and two. I set my lights according to where I'm going to get the most opportunity to get the best action. I generally use three lights when I shoot an event. So my main light will shoot down the start of the track. That I call light one. Light two, I position about right here, and that way it shoots across into turn one. My third light, I position down the back side of the track, firing into turn two. I set both light three and light two on the same channel. This way, when I fire my camera, it will illuminate the whole back half of the track, from turn one all the way through turn two and the back straightaway of the track. Flash one, I set onto its own channel. That way, I'm only lighting the front start of the track. Now occasionally I will take a fourth light with me and I'll position that right about here into turn three and four. I set that on the same channel as the first flash. That way when I pop this flash, this one also goes off, which is cool because now I can focus on firing the start of the jam. And then when the jammer does come around, I can get some really nice shots of them coming around the back turn of the track with a really nice creative shot. Another reason to show up early to the game is you want to talk with the teams that are playing in that game to make sure that you're not going to miss anything that's a special occasion during this event. Is it somebody's first game? Is it somebody's last game? Or is it their birthday? You don't want to miss an opportunity to get a photograph that might be cherished for that person for the rest of their life. Let's talk about photographing the game. Look, I can only be in one place at a time. So I have to pick a position on the track where I have the best opportunity of capturing the peak action of the game. Now we've talked about this a little bit earlier about light placement, but since we already have our lights set up, I need to figure out where I'm going to position myself on the track. Now, if I position myself down the front side of the track, that eliminates me being able to shoot these corners here. So that means I'm pretty much locked down to only being able to shoot the start of the jam or once the jammer has passed the pack and come through. But you're pretty much only going to end up at that point with just a jammer only type of picture. So though I do shoot the front side of the track, most of the time I position myself either here or here because it gives me the biggest amount of the track to shoot with peak action happening within that area. If I position myself here, I can shoot all of turn one and two because of the light positionings. Or if I'm over here, I can shoot turn two and the back straightaway. The reason that this is so important is so much of the action is going to happen when the pack is all jammed together and that jammer is trying to push their way through. So that's going to happen mostly in the turns. Now that you've positioned yourself in spots of the track that are going to have the most peak action during most of the game, you also need to watch for opportunities of shooting stuff like people in the penalty box, people positioning themselves and waiting for the next jam to go in. Because you're going to get a lot of emotions from these areas. So, once you're positioning yourself someplace over here, shooting the front straightaway, you also, while the action is happening on the back side of the track, want to focus on the benches and the penalty box, or maybe the officials, so you can fill in some blanks while the action is happening elsewhere. So while you're shooting the game, let me make a suggestion to you. Always have a main camera that can shoot long ways down the track, like your 70 to 200 that we talked about earlier, 
But having a second camera, such as a wide angle lens, like a 16 to 35 or 24 to 70 lens, can really help make your pictures look different from frame to frame. Look, if you don't have the money for a second camera, you can even use your cell phone for these nice wide angle shots. You're just going to have to keep in mind that you're going to need to be really close to the track, in which case shooting down the straightaways, probably not a useful situation for a cell phone, but in the corners or if you're shooting from the center of the track, you could very well take images with your cell phone. So keep that in mind. In every bout, there's a story and it's your job as a photographer to capture and tell that story. If you go to a game and you just plop yourself down in turn two and sit down and never move, you're not really telling a story. You're just kind of hunting for a picture, like if you're hunting for somebody jumping the apex. Anybody can sit down in a corner and just wait for a jammer to come around the corner and just start squeezing off shots to get somebody jumping the apex. Now, that might be an important part of the story for the player, but let's keep in mind that you're trying to tell the story of the entirety of the game. And by only sitting in one position for the entirety of a game is not going to make a very good story to read. You know, if you're looking through a hundred photographs in a gallery and it's just the same turn over and over again and, and the same jammers coming around the corner over and over again, your viewers are not going to stay till the end of the story. They're going to tune out. So what do I do to vary my images? Between each jam, I position myself at a different place on the track. Why is that important? Because my images are going to vary as I'm moving around the track. I don't just go from one spot to another spot. I work the, the spots. I might sit in turn two, and I, but I will move maybe four feet, five feet over between each jam so that I'm getting a little bit of a different angle and it allows you to capture a different image. Now keep in mind when you're trying to search for these different images to take, think about not only the action that is happening on the track, Part of the story is what's happening in the background. So is the audience there in the background of the image? Are they holding up signs or screaming and yelling or cheering along the action? Making that part of your image is just going to raise that image from being great to amazing. Now, I know I'm telling you to move around the track a lot as the game progresses and trying to get a variance of images. But you also have to keep in mind that you have to position yourself in safe places. And just because you're behind the line does not necessarily mean that you're in a safe place. Sometimes I will shoot from behind the penalty box or sometimes I will shoot from the back side of the track completely and getting uh, silhouettes of my players based off of the positioning of my lights. But I have to keep in mind that entire time is that some place that is safe? Am I putting a player at risk? Am I going to affect the game by where I position myself? Just because there's a box in the, tr in the center of the track doesn't mean that I can just go stand in there and that it, I'm going to be safe and I'm not going to affect the game. When I go to the center of the track, the first thing I do is I let the head ref know that I am there shooting. I don't try and talk with them. I just say, hello, I'm here and I go to my job. I don't want the referees to run into me while they're trying to pay attention to the action that's happening on the track and worry about where I'm at. I want them to be able to focus on the game and not on the photographers. Remember, as a roller derby photographer, it is your job to stay invisible. You're not there to affect the game. You're not there to be the clown of the event. Don't go wearing colorful outfits and sparkles and flashing lights or anything like that. You want to blend in. Wear a dark colored shirt just like the NSOs are required to wear. Try and blend in and not stand out. You're not there to affect the game and the game is not about you. You're there to capture the game. Okay. When shooting roller derby players, you need to think about what angle you're going to shoot the player at. 
If you shoot down onto a player, you're going to make them look like a small child. Think about that when you take a picture of a small child with your cell phone and you're shooting down on them. You're not going to make them look very powerful. So to make them look stronger, I shoot from very low up into the player. And this is much like a comic book, how they would draw a superhero in the comic book cover. Just think about Superman standing there. So let's, let's take a picture shooting down onto the player. And then let's try doing a shot from down below and see the difference. Now you can't even get even lower. For even more impact. So think about that when you're shooting roller derby and your pictures will vastly improve. My final tip for you for shooting roller derby photos is to take a lot of images. You do not want to come home with 100 or 200 images to go through. I take anywhere from 600 to a thousand images per game. It doesn't matter how great of a photographer you are. Roller derby and sports photography in general, it's a numbers game. The more images you take, the more opportunities you catch of getting the peak action. The peak action is going to be your best images. Just like we were talking about an apex jump earlier, if you're just getting an image of the person starting to jump or landing, it's not the same as if you catch them at the peak of the jump. Remember, you're trying to tell a story, and if you're missing a part of that story because you did not take enough images and you let up off of the button while the action continued through, you may actually miss the story. Now that the game is over, it's time to go home and put your images into your computer. As you're going through this thousand images that you took from that day, there's more to it than just sorting through the blurry images or the missed shots. You need to be looking for the images that tell the story. And you want to tell the story by showing a variance of images. By using my tips that I talked about earlier of moving around, your images are going to show a variance as you go through your images. Look, when you start picking your images, don't pick every single position of the jammer going around the track. Look for images that tell the story. An image can be of just the jammer. Remember, in roller derby, the ball is the jammer. So most of the images are going to have the jammer in the image. Yes, you're going to have some background shots of people on the benches, or people in the penalty box, or officials, or the crowd or people holding signs up. The real meat and potatoes of your images are going to be of the jammer and their struggle within the game. So yes, there are going to be images that only have the jammer, but you need to try and work on shots that have the blockers or, or at least another jammer in the image so you can see that there's a struggle going on. And this helps tell the story of roller derby. So what's a good size gallery? As you're calling your images, you want to try and get your images down to a number that is just enough to tell the story and, and enough to get a little bit of everybody in there as well. Just because you shot a thousand pictures does not mean that your gallery should be 500 or 400 pictures. I try and call my images down to no more than 100 images. So a gallery of images that I put out is going to be anywhere from about 50 to 100 images anything past that, you're probably not going to see that your audience goes through all the images in the end. Okay, if you've hung in here this long, you're looking for some camera settings and uh, it's time to nerd out. When using lights, there's one thing that's completely out of my control and that's the sync speed of my camera to my lights. I can only shoot at a shutter speed no greater than one two hundredth of a second. If I go past that, I'm going to start introducing black bars into my image. Being that most of the venues I shoot at are fairly dark, I need to use a fairly wide aperture. Uh, generally, my roller derby images are shot between f5.6 and 2.8. The main aperture I shoot at is f4. That's because I want to have an opportunity to still get separation between my subject and the background, but I want to try and keep as much of them in focus as possible. 
when jam is about to begin, I usually set my camera to f5.6. That way I can get a little bit more in focus as the players are all clumped together. When I'm looking to separate a player from the background a lot, generally in an individual image, I shoot at an aperture of 2.8. When shooting at f2.8, this will give you a lot of separation between the background and the player and almost give it the appearance of being 3D. So now that we've checked off two of the three points in the exposure triangle, now we only have one thing to focus on and that is the ISO. It's controlled by my lights that I'm shooting with in addition to the ambient light of the room. The first thing I do when I get to a venue is I meter to check what the ambient light reading is of that venue. So I take my light meter and I dial it to 1 200th of a second at f4.0 and I take a reading. This will give me an ISO reading of the room. It should be somewhere between 1600 and 3200 ISO. So in order to get some detail in the background, I only want to have my lights about one to one and a half stops brighter than the ambient light in the room. This way I get lots of detail in the background and it helps add to the image. So if I metered an ISO of 1600, I would want to set my light power to actually an ISO of about 800, which is one stop difference. Again, we're trying to maintain detail in the background. Now, if you want to totally kill the light in the background, all you have to do is go two stops over that. So if I was setting the ambient light at 1600, I would want my ISO to actually be at 400 and I can completely kill the light in the background. Once I have my lights dialed in, I never touch the output power. If I change my aperture to 5.6 from f4, that is about a half a stop difference. So I need to increase my ISO by about a half a stop. If I open up my aperture from f4 to 2.8, I've opened up that lens to allow more light to come in. So now I need to decrease my ISO by one full stop. So if I was at ISO 800, I would need to drop my ISO down to ISO 400 and my images would be exposed exactly the same. As long as I do not touch the output power of my lights and just change the ISO settings, my images should look about the same throughout all of my images. And this is one of the benefits to using lights. I know all of this is a lot to take in and you might have to listen to this a couple of times. If you use a recipe like this when you're taking photographs, you're going to find that you're going to increase how fast you're able to edit your images and get them posted. This is my recipe for how to take roller derby images. Your recipe may be different, but once you get it figured out, you should be able to repeat your images from venue to venue without an issue at all. Just keep practicing and you'll get it dialed in in no time. Okay, I'm going to be talking about what's in my bag, but before we do that, I know when I first started taking images, the one thing that really bothered me was people that had a ton of gear that I could not afford, and I would always use excuses as, that's why I cannot get those types of photos. Don't be that kind of person. Just understand, I've had over 20 years to accumulate all of this gear, but please, remember, do not let gear define whether or not you can be a photographer and please do not get hung up on what I have and that's what makes me a better photographer. One thing I do want to point out is I am going to be talking about fixed aperture lenses. That's where I can set the aperture and throughout the focal zoom I'm not going to see a change in the aperture. Some lenses that you're going to look at are going to have an unfixed aperture of like 3.5 to 5.6 or even more as you zoom in or out. And you don't really want that because it doesn't play well when I'm using lights. The one issue you're going to run into when it comes to fixed aperture lenses is they're quite expensive. So you don't have to go out and buy the 2.8 versions of every lens. You'll notice in my bag I do not always have the 2.8 versions of the lenses. They are preferable. That'll allow you to open your lens up in darker and darker venues. But now that I'm using lights and one of my main apertures is f4, 
I tend to buy a lot of F4 versions of the lenses because they cost about half as much. So when putting together your camera bag, consider buying F4.0 lenses to save a little bit of money and save a little bit more if you can find them used. You may be able to get two or three lenses for the cost of one brand new 2.8 lens. All right, let's jump into my bag. So first thing will be the camera bag. I use a Burton Focus 30 liter camera bag. Um, I've tried about a dozen different bags over the last couple of years and I keep coming back to the Burton bag. And uh, as we go through it, I think you'll see why I choose the Burton bag. All right, so let's go in the bag, open it up from the back side. Okay, so let's start with the first thing, my main camera. This is a Canon 1DX Mark III. It's brand new. I haven't really used it for roller derby at all yet, and I'm really looking forward to getting out there and using it. It's a great camera, and I'm really excited about this. My next camera body is the 1DX, the original one. Both of these cameras have great ISO capabilities. They can shoot in really dark rooms, but the main thing that they do is they track focus really, really well. Um, so as the player's rounding the corner, if they're going between players, these cameras will still lock in focus and I'll get a lot of great images with these. This is a spot where my Canon 5D Mark IV goes. I use that body mainly for my portrait work, like my five player shots and my end of the game shots. All right, the first lens is the Canon 70 to 200 2.8 lens. This is a standard lens that you're gonna find in just about every sports photographer's bag. Um, this is a great lens if you're shooting down the track. If you shoot on the wide side, it's a fairly wide lens. It's 70 millimeters, but you can zoom in really nice and tight and get some great separation with this 2.8 aperture lens. Next up is my second favorite lens. This is the Canon 24 to 105 f4 lens. This is generally on my second camera body. Um, this is great for shooting on the inside of the track at 24 millimeters. I'm still able to get the ref coming through and the jammers as they round the corner. When still in the center of track, I can zoom out to 105 millimeters and turn over and face the jammers before they start going and get some really nice portraits with their bench in the background. So I really love this lens and uh, I can't imagine shooting roller derby without it. And the last lens is a 16 to 35 millimeter 2.8 lens. This is great for shooting uh, venue shots. I can pretty much get the entire venue when I'm zoomed out to 16 millimeters. If I zoom out to 35 millimeters, I'm able to shoot from the center of the track and get the jammer coming around the corner with the entire audience in the background. Again, this is mainly for shooting venue shots or something where I'm trying to establish where the game took place. Also in my bag, I always have a microfiber. If I'm gonna be setting my lenses down, I want them to uh, stay nice. The last thing in my camera bag is my 1.4 tele-extender. This will increase the focal length of my lenses by 1.4 multiplication. Um, it does come at a cost of, if I'm shooting it a 2.8 lens, it now becomes an F4 lens. So you do lose a little bit, but it's not that big of a deal. All right, that's it for this side of the camera bag. Let's close it up and turn it over and show you what's on the other side. All right, let's go into the top of the bag. This is actually my favorite compartment that most bags are missing. I kind of call this my junk drawer, but you're gonna see how much I can really fit in here and how well it stays organized. All right, the first pouch is this top pouch right here. Let's pull this out. This is a card reader where I can take the cards from my camera and load them right into my telephone. It's great to have at the venue um, for when I need to post pictures right away. This is a Joby uh, holder for my phone. I'm able to put this onto a tripod or monopod and take quick video with it. Uh, this is called a Brass Monkey. That's the only nickname I've ever heard, but this goes on to stands and this will allow you to put multiple items onto your stand. Um, without it, you won't be able to put anything onto your light stand, so these are a must-have. I always carry an extra one with me. And the next thing is a gel kit for my AD200 flashes um, in case I want to be creative with uh, some colors. 
when I'm taking my five player shots or if I want to light the background a little bit differently to make the images look completely different. Uh, this is a great little kit that hardly costs anything. And that's it in this pouch. Okay, let's go into the main uh, slot of this compartment. Uh, this is a pouch for my Rode mics that I'm currently using right now. These little things right here. These are great to have when I'm shooting video. Another Rode mic. This is a um, Rode Mic Pro. These are great to have when shooting venues um, and that way you can get some ambient noise going on in the games. I have a GoPro um, in case I want to do a time lapse of the game um, or I set up a bunch of time lapses on my way to and from the game if I want to put together a quick video. The next little camera I have is a DJI Pocket Osmo. This is great for video. I hardly use this, but it takes amazing video. I need to start using this more. Um, it's a great tool to have. If I don't use it too much longer, it's coming out of the bag. Okay, we've talked a lot about lights. These are my remote triggers that go on my cameras to trigger my lights. This is the new Godox X2T trigger. Uh, the reason I bought this is, is it has a setting on here where I can turn the modeling lamps off and uh, that's always been a problem with these triggers. I can't figure out how to turn the modeling lamps on or on or off if I want to from my lights as I'm using them. So this one will allow me to turn it off. The next thing is my Think Tank card holder. I've got all the different kinds of cards. I use CF cards, SD cards, and uh, new CF Express cards in my 1DX Mark III. Um, should always have plenty of them. And remember, always put your cards in before you leave to the game and make sure they're all formatted. All right, the next item is a multi-tool. This is just a cheap $10 multi-tool off of Amazon. It's got like a little Swiss Army knife set of different tools and some pliers. These are great for uh, just about anything when something goes wrong. And not having it could mean the difference between you being able to shoot or not be able to shoot. So for 10 bucks, I'll always include this in every single one of my bags. And the last thing that's in the bag is a power supply. Uh, this power supply, I have no idea what brand name it is. But this thing will allow me to power my MacBook Pro off of it without plugging into the wall. And also it'll charge everything that I have, like my GoPro or my DJI camera. They're uh, great to have and it hardly adds any weight to the camera bag. So highly suggested. All right, next in the camera bag, told you this is a junk drawer. This is my pouch with all my batteries for all my cameras. Um, I even carry some uh, AA batteries to swap out my triggers if one of them goes down. So always good to have, always carry extra batteries for everything that you use. In the last pouch here, I have one thing in here. It's a variable ND filter. This is used for shooting video. I'm not really gonna go into it, but it has earned a spot in my bag. So that's the junk drawer. Let's go to the next spot. The next spot is uh, this zipper pouch right here. And notice every single one of these zippers that I have on this bag has two zippers on it. That way if one breaks, I'm still able to open and close it. And that's a tip when you go to buy a backpack like this for your camera gear. So first thing, got a Sharpie pen. You should always have these. Um, it really comes in handy when you're trying to label something. Um, some places you have a photographer spot and I smack down a little bit of gaffer tape and write my name on it. That way if anybody has any questions or concerns they can come talk to me. Um, the next up is my first light meter. I'm currently carrying two with me because I still don't quite trust my new one yet. So this is my good old reliable Polaris light meter. These things are about $85 used on, on eBay. And I'll be honest with you, that's really all you need to meter your lights uh, for shooting roller derby. That's not for studio photography, but for roller derby. Um, my new main light meter, or going to be my light, main light meter, is the Sekonic light meter. Um, this is a little bit more fancy. I just haven't used it very many times yet, so it hasn't earned the sole spot for light meter. And... Uh, I've talked about this many times. This is my color checker passport. This is how I get the crazy colors that I get um, when I'm shooting pictures. And uh, as always, I use a gray card. 
It's a must have. I will not shoot without it. It's just a must have for me. Got an instruction manual for the flash point triggers because I still don't know how to turn off the modeling lamps on my lights. Got a few microfibers because every photographer should have a bunch of them. And then again, a Swiss Army knife. Uh, you never know when you need to unscrew or screw something down. And a little swag that's in there. I don't know what's up with that, but Tough Girls on Eight Wheels sticker. Every camera bag should have one. All right, one more zipper pouch here in the top section. We're not done yet, but let's see what we got here. Um, I've got some granola bars. Another microfiber. A hair tie. These things are super good. You never know when you're going to need these, so have one or two of them in your bag at all times. And the last thing is my medicine pouch. Um, look, camera gear is not the only thing that can break down while you're out taking pictures. I keep some cough drops, some stomach medication, some Tylenol, and uh, some antihistamine medicine in there because sometimes things go wrong with me and I don't want it to stop me from being able to shoot the game. So that's an easy fix. All right, so here's the top of the bag. So first thing, um, I have these clipped on the outside of the bag, but two rolls of gaffer tape, black and white white when I need to write on it and identify myself and black if I'm trying to fix like a garment problem or something of that nature or I just need to tape something down. All right, in this pouch is where my water bottle goes. I do not leave home without a water bottle. You need to drink during the games. These things are long, so make sure you bring yourself a good water bottle. There's also another slot right here where I can throw another water bottle for myself. Over here in the front compartment is where my laptop goes. And also in there are my pair of knee pads. Look, you don't want to shoot a two hour game without some knee pads where you're getting up and down shooting my style of roller derby. And that's about it there. Um, let's look on the side here. I've got another pouch and I think there's just two things left in it. This is a blower. Um, Every camera bag should have this. It's just to blow out dust out of your lens or your camera body. Definitely get this. You can get cheap knockoffs for like seven bucks. It's not that big of a deal. Also in the bottom of this bag is a three-way extension. Um, if I'm using the power at a venue to power my laptop and somebody else wants to come over and use the outlet, uh, this is a must-have. <laughs> Uh, that way we can both get power, but I'll be honest with you, I end up loaning this out most times when there's people looking for extension cords at games. Um, things usually start to get pretty hectic, and uh, this can earn you some favors. So, cheap little device that hardly takes up any room. It's a no-brainer for me. And the last thing I have on the side of this camera bag is my... Insta360 camera. Um, I don't use this nearly as much as I probably should, but this takes great images um, that are going to be different than basically anything anybody else is getting right now. Or if you want to get like a good chant before the game starts on video, you just throw this over top of them and you can get some really stellar video like this. Um, not a must have, but just another toy that I carry around with me need to use it a little bit more it's going to lose its spot in my bag all right that's pretty much my camera bag let's move on to my light bag and you can see the rest of my gear this is my light bag it's made by Fotex it's called a 48 inch Fotex gear bag I purchased it off of B&H so uh, if you're looking for something like this you might want to check it out first up there's two little side pouches here each side pouch is exactly the same and it's a perfect size to hold two of my Flashpoint Evolve 200s, better known as the Godox AD200. There's four of these in the bag, uh, two in each pouch. Right here is the battery for the flash. This thing will get you about 2,000 flashes at a quarter power. Most of the time I'm shooting at like a 16th or a 32nd. So these things will last me all day long, no problem at all. I don't even take extra batteries with me. Okay, let's open the bag up. Again, double zippers. Right here on top are my uh, Godox S-T 
type brackets. These are made to uh, put the flashes on your light stand because these flashes only have little nubs to put them onto a light stand and then they won't tilt. So this will allow me to put the flash in and then tilt it wherever I'm directing it. Also, the S-Type bracket has a Bowens mount system where I'm able to put my large light modifiers that I talked about earlier in this video. Uh, these things are great and they're fairly inexpensive. I think these are about $16 a piece. So four of these for my four flashes. And last up are the light stands. Um, this is a 10 foot light stand made by Linko. These were designed to be backdrop light stands, but these have a, they're very narrow and they can fit in this bag really good. Um, and they also have these uh, rubber tips at the end so that the light stands don't skid around. Um, I love these things. Um, I don't know if they make them anymore, but you can check them out. It's Linco, L-I-N-C-O. So there's four of them in here. And that's it, that's my entire light kit. So that sums up my total gear bag that I take with me to games. Um, the only thing I did not show are my light reflectors. I usually use two of the long throw reflectors. Sometimes they're called Colt 45s if you look them up on Amazon. And then I use the little uh, seven inch reflectors in the turns and they'll light the entire turn evenly. And those things come with the lights, but they're just called seven inch reflectors with a Bowens mount. I hope that answers any questions as to what I have in my bag and why it's in my bag. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me via email or here on Facebook. Thank you very much.